Welcome into the PFF podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson. Mike Renner is on secret assignment. Sam, yeah, he is on secret assignment right now. Oh, I didn't, I didn't start it the way he did. Normally, our weekend preview host, uh, Mike, will, you know, he'll say, "What is up?" He will. So I just said it. What is up? There you go. Uh, Mike's out right now. Uh, not suspension worthy. He no. got permission this time. Uh, I'm Endorsement, hoping. in fact. We've endorsed this trip. Fully endorsed. Um, I, I hope that we can reveal where he is well, soon. We'll reveal it at one, one way or the other. So At some point, we will. So, so stay tuned for that. I'm hoping we reveal it with good news, yeah. so to speak. I'm hoping it's a successful trip for Mike. So uh, thoughts and prayers with uh, Mike Renner as he uh, ventures off into this venture. How's that? Uh, clunky and ugly, but carry on. That's how I do my intro. <laughs> I'm just trying to stay with my shtick. Let's get into this weekend's games. Uh, it's a full slate, Sam. We're uh, we're at the end of the season. There are no more buys. We've got more work to do. That's I how say, I. That's exactly what that means. That's we how have more I interpret work to do. it. We we have like a little bit of a lull during the season. Oh, we get some buys. We have less work to do. No, it's a full slate this weekend. Let's start with the Chicago Bears traveling to the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, the Bengals, who I, I nailed the coffin in them a couple weeks ago, and then they, they had signs of life, but a very difficult loss on Monday Night yeah. Football at home against you were the Pittsburgh right. Steelers. We were right. They we just, were right. They just made it look like it was closer than it was, and then the nail was back in the coffin this past week. I like the way Ben described, by the way, the, w- the easiest way of dealing with the extra work is to just shaft you and me a bit more. Yeah, he did specifically say that. Ben. It's just the easiest way of fixing it all. Look, right. the easiest way of scheduling these extra games is just a shaft, Sam and Steve. Give more to Sam and Steve. Um, yeah, no, uh, the the Bengals did have some... The Bengals aren't a bad team. They were just unfortunately done. Um, and the Steelers really hammered the nail into that coffin. Well, um, so the Bengals, the Bengals were an interesting team as in that we knew where their weakness was, the offensive line this year. Uh, I don't think we knew how good some of their pass rush would be again yeah. you know, the breakout season from Carl Lawson, uh, Geno Atkins still doing his thing, Carlos Dunlap still productive. Uh, so I like to for teams that we think you know aren't going to make the playoffs or they definitely won't make the playoffs, uh, giving them something to look out for, something to watch this weekend, and something to have hope for the future. I'm I'm trying to stay positive here. Okay, I think their emerging pass rush is something to build around. Now it's about marrying that with you know the coverage on the back end, and then they do have to figure out what's going to happen up front on that offensive line. Uh, one other note, though, to John Ross, officially to the IR and a very, very disappointing rookie season for the ninth overall pick. The IR. I like it. Um, that pass rush, the young pass rushes, the Carl Lawson, Jordan Willis thing, that has cooled down a lot, though, as the season has worn on. Um, it has. Maybe they've hit that fabled rookie wall, but they're definitely less of a factor now than they were earlier in the season. The single biggest reason for optimism for the Bengals is – William Jackson, who, frankly, yes. it looks like one of the best young corners in the entire National Football League, despite, for some reason, not starting, because who the hell knows. But William Jackson going up against Antonio Brown for two games this season, eight targets, zero receptions, and four pass breakups. That is basically the best anybody has Unreal. played Antonio Brown for a long time. It's legit coverage. Too. Yeah, there was, yeah. There was a, Roethlisberger made a great pass to Antonio Brown on one of those deep balls on Monday night, puts it on his hands, Jackson rips it out. I mean, he has played really tight coverage against Antonio Brown. I mean, he legitimately, there, there aren't many corners in the league can even come close to that level of performance against Antonio Brown. Now, obviously, it's still small sample sizes, but it's enough of a sample size to make you look at that and go, okay, why is anybody getting snaps over him right. ever? No, he should be the guy, and that was a guy that we really liked quite a bit. He graded well for us in college uh you wrote a nice little piece on him the day of the combine when he went out there and ran i believe as a sub four four and we said hey he might be the best pure corner in that draft of course jalen ramsey was also in that draft and you know ramsey was still developing as a corner but uh, you know jackson's up there and he's one of those very many uh good young corners around the league so that is something to watch and something to be optimistic about uh chicago on the other side uh, i still want to see them unleash uh mitch trubisky a little bit more unleash him uh, look, he's, he, I, I was talking to Zach a little bit. We broke down uh, Jimmy Garoppolo's game for San Francisco, went in depth about uh, how he played against Chicago the other day. When I was talking to Zach off the air, though, he said, when you watch Trubisky and Garoppolo, 
side by side, you see a lot of the same traits. You see a lot of the yeah. same attributes, the quick release and accurate to the middle of the field in similar ways. So, uh, you know, the, the Niners are letting Garoppolo throw the ball. So Trubisky only threw 15 passes last week against San Francisco. I want to see what they can do with him down the stretch here. Yeah, I think that's a good call. They need to they need to see more. They need to let him do more. I mean, that's the bottom line is. Agreed. You know, we talked before about him being a guy that I think doesn't need to be coddled. You know, he's right. a guy that is, is going to get it, I think, pretty quickly. And But in order for him to do that, you need to actually let him take the shots. You know, it was a bit like when the Giants put Geno Smith out there with the idea of we need to see what we have in Geno Smith and then hamstrung him with this ridiculous game plan that didn't wasn't going to tell you what he could do. Like, what's the point? If you want to see what he can do, open it up and let's see what he can do. There's no point in sending him out there running this conservative... Yeah, I don't need to know how well a guy throws a screen. Yeah, I don't need to know how well he can do things that aren't very difficult to do. Um, so it's just, I think it's the same deal with Trubisky. Let's open it up and see what he can actually do as opposed to how well he can orchestrate this extremely conservative no mistake offense last thing if you're looking for an individual matchup to watch it is josh Sitton, left guard for the chicago bears annually one of the best pass blockers in the entire nfl when he gets matched up against geno atkins annually one of the best interior pass rushers in the nfl that would be the matchup to watch who you got in this game sam Bengals. yes i'm taking the Bengals as well and uh yeah the bears went from a promising season to uh pretty disappointing picking top 10 again next year but I still think the real bit rebuild is on the upswing. Uh, let's go to Tampa Bay. We've got the Lions traveling to play the Bucks. What are your thoughts on this game, Sam? It looks like Detroit's on their last legs as far as uh, NFC playoff picture goes. Well, yeah, this is so all through the season. The analytics have been saying that the Detroit Lions are not as good as their record says they are. And for the past two weeks, it looks like they're coming down to that level. And they are actually edging back towards where we said they should have been all along, um, given what the roster and that performance level has been. This will be an interesting game because, you know, the Bucks are a dangerous team still. They're capable of a uh, big performance. The Lions are struggling. They're, I, I mean, they're probably out of it, to be honest, but they're at a very minimum on their last legs. Um, and they need a performance that last week was pretty uh, ugly. They lost to the Vikings, obviously, who were one of the best teams out there. Um, but I think they're. I think we're starting to see that there are a lot of flaws on that roster, and they're just not as good as they threaten to be. Yeah, definitely a a rough uh, decline, I'd say. You know, for the Lions, uh, guys like Anthony Zettel, you know, pass rusher, who we were touting as one of the reasons why they were overachieving earlier in the season. You see, uh, he's had only one pressure in uh, two out of his last three games. So you you see games where. You know, Zettel being their most efficient pass rusher isn't getting isn't getting home like he was earlier in the year, and probably regressing back into into what he was. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, across the defense. So, uh, you know, I, I think the Lions did kind of become what we thought they would be, and uh, that's a, it's a flawed team. Uh, the other thing to keep an eye on: Taylor Decker has been back in the lineup the last few weeks, but not really playing all that well. We kept saying how that's going to be an upgrade over. Greg Robinson at left tackle and Taylor Decker was outstanding as a rookie for a rookie tackle. You know, one of the better performances we've seen over the last few years, but we also didn't really love him coming out of college. He wasn't a, a great pass blocker at Ohio state. He was more of a mauling run blocker. And I feel like he's kind of crept back toward that, uh, you know, questionable pass blocking uh, Taylor Decker that we saw coming out of college. So that's something to keep an eye on. For Detroit, I don't know if Tampa Bay is the right team to take advantage, though, as far as their pass rush goes. No, and it still is a significant upgrade. You know, even if yeah, he's, absolutely. Like he's at this point where he's played pretty consistently below average every game since he's come back, but that's still dramatically better than terrible. Dramatically better than terrible. So who you got in this game, Sam? We got Detroit and Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay's out of it. Detroit is at 6-6 six and six and still technically one of those if they win out and they land at 10-6. and six could sneak into the playoff picture, but the NFC is just so loaded. Yeah, and I think this is the week that the nail gets put in their coffin. I'm going with the Bucks. So you're taking the Bucks. So yep. no more Detroit. I'm taking the Lions at Tampa Bay. I don't love it, but I'm taking Detroit. The analytics gives them the, the win projections that we put out this week has Detroit winning one more game. 
Yeah, but we probably had them winning three games oh, yeah. all season no, anyway. They've been harsh on them all year. I'm just saying they're still <laughs> harsh on them. They haven't been winning one of the remaining four games. Send all your complaints to Mr. Eric Eager and uh, George. We'll all be right, on next. later. <laughs> they will be on later with your lock of the week, which uh, I've. What are they? they are ten and three so far in their locks of the week. So I do highly suggest that you get in there and listen to the. Uh, to the lock of the week. And actually, if you're listening right now, if you want to, you could fast forward to them if you just want to skip over well, some no. of them. Hey, now. I'm just saying. No, no, no. We, I don't know if we're bringing it Let's today. not go crazy. All right, don't fast forward. Just wait. Listen wait to out. them when, they, when we get to them. When we get to but them. But don't go crazy now. All right, Green Bay traveling to Cleveland. This was the game we looked at a few weeks ago and said, if Green Bay can hold on just long enough, they will get to the Cleveland Browns game. Uh, Green Bay hasn't really held off long <laughs> enough. They are also... Uh, on their last leg, six and six in uh, win out mode. Uh, supposedly, Aaron Rodgers might be able to come back next week, week 15. Uh, Cleveland Browns uh, just fired Sashi Brown, their yeah. general manager. So there's a lot going on as far as the front office goes. Uh, what are your thoughts on this game? Can Cleveland pick up their first win? Yeah, this is the just stay alive long enough till Aaron Rodgers has a chance. Right. That's all it is. It just still might be too late. In just the be mathematically there so that Aaron Rodgers can come back and potentially get us to the playoffs. Um, I mean, yeah, look, the, the Browns are not very good. I think it's a shame that they've ended this experiment before we really had a handle on what it was producing. I don't think, I think right now nobody has any idea whether this was working or not. I think everything was working to plan-ish, other than the fact that they're probably worse this year than they would have hoped. You know, we, but you know, coming into this season, you pick the Browns to win, to lose 16 very close games, which to be honest is more or less what they've done. They've challenged yeah. a lot of teams. They just haven't won any yet. So it's not like this is a complete shock that we expect them to be dramatically better. The Kaiser thing we talked about essentially being a shot in the dark that this guy, a lot of people touted as a first round pick. He was there when they picked in the second. So let's see what he has. Yeah, right. No problem there. It doesn't look like he's the answer, but. They weren't really expecting him to be, I don't think. It was just too good a value to pass up at that That's point. That's exactly how I view the Kaiser pick. Exactly. That's exactly so how I it should be I think the viewed. entire thing is working out to plan right now, and they've ended the experiment before we've had a chance to see it work its way to its logical conclusion. You, yeah, you can't execute a three- to five-year plan in two years. Exactly. Or a year and a half. You so just I just, can't do it. I think that whole thing is a bit of a shame that it's worked out that way, and who knows what they're going to lurch to at this point because... You know, typically when you end one thing, you end up lurching all the way back to the opposite extreme. Right. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why a lot of these teams stay struggling for so long, because you don't stick with one thing, regardless of what that one thing is for any, any period of time. So you're never even doing one consistent thing. You're always in a halfway house, which just becomes a mess. The opposite being here in Cincinnati with the Bengals, <laughs> yeah. where they stick to uh, the same thing. But that kind of proves the point in that, They've never, you know, they haven't necessarily been particularly good at that one thing for any period of time, but they've at least been consistently doing one thing for the better part of a There's decade. There's a level of consistency. There so they've here. always so been yeah. okay. Yep. Um, but you know, the bottom line is the Browns are kind of still in turmoil. They haven't won games. The Packers are still a reasonable roster, and that run game has actually been formidable. Ironically, if Rodgers gets back and they're still in contention, he could be walking into a better situation than he left in terms of having a much stronger running game and that kind of thing. So, you know, Brett Hundley's not great, but then the Browns have worse Brett Hundley's at quarterback. So the Packers win. The yeah, end. the Packers will win. Uh, Josh Gordon last week did uh, make his big return. He was targeted 11 times, four receptions, 85 yards, and uh, 76 of which were against who? Casey Hayward. Casey Hayward, maybe the best corner. Casey Hayward, who came out and said that Josh Gordon was the toughest assignment he had had this year, having been through a list of number one uh, wide receivers. Basically, every top receiver you can think of, Casey Hayward has played this season and said Josh Gordon, fresh off the couch after three years, was the toughest guy he'd have to cover. It's impressive. Josh Gordon has that about him. You know, when a couple years ago and People didn't know what they were getting, and he was a supplemental pick, and you just don't know what you're getting, and he just always gets out there, and it's like, oh, he's faster than he than you think he is. He's got good ball skills. He does so much. Well, there's two X about. factors. There's one. I mean, Julio Jones is the closest thing in today's NFL to Randy Moss in terms of being bigger, faster, and stronger than you are, basically just being too athletic for you to cover. He's had one half of your tag team? Yes. That's right. Josh Gordon is the next best thing. Josh Gordon can run him close in terms of that. Um and the other X factor is, from the sounds of it, Josh Gordon is playing basically his entire career either hammered or stoned or both. 
and maybe now he isn't. We just don't know if that's a positive or negative, though. <laughs> we don't. That's I'm going to assume... And I'm being dead honest there. Like You just don't know if the, some guys actually do play better or worse. The in those stone situations. thing, I think, could go either way. Right. The drunk thing, I think, is almost certainly a negative. True. If you're playing drunk, you're probably not playing well. No. I can't think of too many athletic endeavors I've, I've done in the past that would have been improved had I been drunk. I don't have a baseball story for that. Excellent. Um, so I think it, I think it's reasonable to assume that if Josh Gordon is clean for the first time in his career, he could be better than we've seen in the past, which was pretty spectacular. And now look, when you're, if you're completely objective about the Browns right now, they've added a lot of talent the last two years, defensive side of the ball, especially, I still think the arrow's pointing up for this franchise, even if they don't win a game this year. Uh, so we're both taking Green Bay, even with, uh, Mr. Uh, Brett Hundley. Well, like I say, the, the, the Browns have worse Brett Hundleys. Hundley had, what, eight, eight air yards? Yes. Go back and listen to the Monday podcast. What a stat on Brett Hundley. <laughs> Moving on to the Indianapolis Colts at the Buffalo Bills. We had last week Tyrod Taylor banged up, came out of the game a little bit early against New England after struggling. Uh, his status still up in the air. Uh, poor Tredavious White comes up with a nice interception, and then Gronk smokes him in the head to give him a concussion. His... his uh, a status also up in the air. Taylor's laughing at me. That's just what happened, man. Took a forearm shiver to the back of the head by uh, Gronk, one half of my tag team. High voltage 2000 with J.J. Watt. Uh, what do you got in this game, Sam? Colts at Bills. Well, this hinges on Tyrod Taylor being healthy, I think. Why? Because he played he, so bad last year, he did. last week. He did play bad. Red zone interception to kick off the, the on the first drive. It was bad. But he's a lot better than Peterman. Yeah, he's better than what we've seen from Mr. Nathan Peterman. Um, I, I mean, I really think that's a big part of it. The, <laughs> the Colts, I think, are the more interesting team there. Honestly, it looks, it kind of feels like the Bills have been trying to tank the entire season and are consistently annoyed by the fact that they keep winning games somehow. We're um, over there talking about their promising young secondary. They've they're shaking themselves for, <laughs> yeah, for playing exactly. well. Like, damn, I called the right coverages this week. They shut down two of their more important players, Jordan Matthews um, and the edge rusher Lawson. Shaq Lawson? Shaq Lawson, yeah. On IR. Um, so two guys that they kind of need shut down on their most crucial stretch of the season. I think that ultimately the Bills are going to succeed in failing to make the playoffs. Um, but I think they probably still take the Colts. Uh, does Jacoby Brissett remain intriguing for you? Always. Okay. Uh, something has to give here with the Indianapolis Colts offensive line. Uh, bad in the past game, but also bad, you know, as far as the uh, run blocking goes, going up against a pretty bad Buffalo run defense. Bad so I think that, bad. yeah, so I think that bad matchup will be uh, perhaps the one to watch if Indianapolis can get a little bit something going on the ground because Buffalo, especially these last few weeks, have had bouts where they've just been gashed up front through the middle. Biggest like surprise entry in team of the week this this past week was Mike Person, center for the Indianapolis Colts. First game he started all season, had a, a monster game, um, didn't allow any pressure, it was huge in the run game against the Jags defense. Um, just rather bizarre um, shock performance out of nowhere. Mike Person, how about that? He last played in 2015, 962 snaps with only 67 snaps before that. So yeah, so definitely a uh, a random team of the weaker uh, every week I've been saying that this Indianapolis defense is one that if they just had Andrew Luck and a good offense, we might be talking about some of the, uh, you know, the Jonathan Hankins and, uh, you know, Jabal Sheard being one of the better offseason pickups, you know, this year. Rashawn Melvin, we, we'd be talking about these overachieving players on the defense for Indianapolis and figuring out if they're part of the rebuild. I kind of like what they've done with their veterans. They still need this influx of youth on the defensive side, but they've you know they've patched together that defense oh you know pretty well for uh what they were dealing with yeah i think there's some talent there to work with um they're a franchise i think generally is moving in the right direction um they just need they're in a weird spot at the quarterback position now yeah we don't know what the real future is for andrew luck we'll talk plenty about him this offseason when we're talking quarterback carousel and where these guys are going uh but for now this week whether it's nathan peterman or tyrod taylor there is you know some there is a difference there, but uh, I'm going with Buffalo. What, what do you have in this game, Sam? Yep, Bills. I think we're both assuming Tyrod. We'll be back for that. Hoping, hoping, because otherwise that is a lot less surefire thing. 
one of the better games of the week now. Minnesota Vikings traveling to Carolina to take on the Panthers. Are we expecting this to be the week where the wheels fall off for Case Keenum? Every week. He keeps closing. He's been better and better these last few weeks, though. Still taking pretty good care of the ball. Not taking sacks. Getting rid of it. Adam Thielen whooping dudes off the line of scrimmage. Nice, uh, nice tweet, by the way. How many uh, retweets on your Adam Thielen? Four odd thousand retweets, 10,000 likes. No, like nobody's counting. Nobody's counting. Not but, that I've looked. Uh, there were also, when you go back and watch this tape, uh, this isn't one of those things where like, you say, hey, Case Keenum's missing reads and he left plays on the table. But there were some you know, busted coverages that Thielen was just running wide open through the defense, which maybe within the progression Keenum could have found him. Uh, my point is, Thielen and Diggs are still probably the best wide receiver duo in the NFL yeah. and uh, continue to elevate that passing attack. What are you seeing in this game, Sam? The the play of Case Keenum really is amazing. Um, like I tweeted in that game as well. There was a play that he made where the pocket collapsed around him. He moved to his left and didn't panic, just kept sliding, sliding, sliding. The guys were coming for him, were look, kept his eyes downfield, eventually found the pass to make and got rid of the ball without under any real duress. Um, like For anyone claiming that there's nothing different between Case Keenum this year and in past it's just that there's no jeff fisher there's nothing working against him now he's in a better situation i mean it just isn't true he's playing dramatically better he doesn't make that same play a year ago or even you know before in his career and he's making those consistently this year it's like what we talked about he has the league's lowest sack percentage in terms of the number of plays that he's pressured that turn into sacks he is at the the sharp end of that scale because he makes all these plays where he's under pressure mitigates that by getting rid of the ball and I still don't trust it. I'm still waiting for the Case Keenum wheels to fall off, but it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, the, the Panthers, I think, overall look like a less formidable defense than the Falcons had uh, last week where the Vikings were able to get it done. On the other side of the ball, Minnesota's defense remains one of the, the toughest in the league. They're going up against a unique weapon in um, Cam Newton and a... I guess also a kind of unique weapon in Christian McCaffrey, albeit one that I don't think has been fully, the potential has been fully realized there. But the Panthers are an extremely difficult team to match up with, even if they're not as good as other offenses. I think that's where Harrison Smith yes. comes into play. His versatility at safety. And we talked about safeties on the Mailbag podcast. And just if you have one of those top three safeties, which Harrison Smith is, uh, the ability, if they're a versatile guy that can play deep, can play in the box, and he is just so quick to the ball sometimes in the run game, in the screen game. Those are those plays where they're trying to get McCaffrey the ball. Yeah. So expect Smith to just get in there, blow up a couple screens, uh, have to tackle McCaffrey in space. He's going to be a big key in this one. He is. The other player that's going to be a big key on the, almost in the other direction, though, is Anthony Barr because those are the two guys I think that are going to see a lot of Christian McCaffrey. And if it's, if it's Harrison Smith, they've got a reasonable chance of going one-on-one. -on -one. The Panthers are going to hope they can scheme as much McCaffrey on Anthony Barr as humanly possible, because that is a big mismatch in the favor of the Panthers. And right. that's the player that the Vikings will have covering running backs out of the, uh, out of the backfield a lot, typically. And it feels like something that they should try and change this week. But, you know, we know how reluctant teams are to change what it is they do week in, week out, especially when it's successful. Um, I don't know if they're going to want to do that heading into this game. And if they don't, that's potentially a problem for them. I'm still fascinated by the fact that Anthony Barr is a coverage first player. Like he's a, he's a, he's a traditional linebacker yeah. when he essentially got drafted to be a pass rusher. His uh, pass rush uh, percentage, the percentage that he's actually rushed the passer, has declined every year of his career. I remember being on this podcast four years ago being like, all right, what are they doing? They're experimenting with them. Why is he becoming this traditional linebacker? He was supposed to be this edge rusher. He's only rushed the passer more than 10 times in the game once this year. It's, it's the blitz game. It's that, you know, mix it up. And, um, but he does, that is a weapon still that they have and something to keep an eye on there where they move him around and throw him the a gap. And when you have Everson Griffin coming off the edge and some of those, that other defensive line talent with the Linval Joseph, uh, love what Barr can bring to the defense now that he's bounced back from last year's, right? Last year's yeah. uh, uh, weird. There must have been an injury then, right? Yeah, I would think so because it's just not in line with the rest of his career. He was outstanding in 2015, huge step back last year and, and back to form so far this season. Uh, Carolina's offense we've talked about quite a bit, and uh, <laughs> it's going to be Cam Newton, man. 
Cam Newton's got to make more throws. We mm-hmm. talked about it on Well Actually this week. So Been banned from talking Panthers and Cam Newton's offense from, yeah. from now on. Taylor just straight cut us out. Said no more Panthers offense. All right, what do, you got in this go- what do we have in this one? I'm going to go with the Vikings. Last, I'm taking the Vikings too. Last week I went Falcons. This week I'm going back to the Vikings. I think my heart's saying Carolina's going to upset them. Oh, yeah? Right. Because the, the, well, this, uh, this counts. Is, this counts. If you've, if you've at least told the people that you're thinking it, you're, you're good enough. You can claim it. But on Twitter, on my picks, it's Minnesota. That's okay. You, as long as you can point back to somewhere where you said, I think it's going to happen this way, you can claim it as a moral victory. So unless it's a tie, I am right yes. on this game. All right, let's go to the AFC West. Oakland Raiders taking on the Kansas City Chiefs. Man, the Chiefs are falling left and right. They're coming in hot. They're all tied atop the AFC West. Chiefs, Raiders, and the Chargers all tied at 6-6. Six and six. PFF picks, though, only Gordon is taking Oakland. So, spoiler yeah. alert, we're both taking the <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs. Um, is it more than just the fact that they're playing at home that has you taking the Chiefs? I So... This whole division has come back together. The, the top three teams are 6-6. Six and six. Um, I don't know that anyone has been truly convinced by the Raiders coming back. You know, I think the Chargers at least have looked hot. They've looked impressive in this come back towards the pack, <laughs> right as Mike jumped off their bandwagon. The Raiders, I don't think, have really looked formidable in doing it. They just happened to have picked up the right games, and they're, they're back in it. Um, the Chiefs, I think, were... The, the biggest concern with them, as we said, was that Alex Smith had disappeared. He'd gone from being the quarterback that found the missing piece to his puzzle to being the quarterback that only had the missing piece left and had lost all the other pieces. Last week, and he then got... the every- Jets happened. Yeah, la- then the Jets happened. Last week, he actually found all the pieces again. Uh, only everybody else played badly, so it didn't matter. Um, I think if they get that guy again, I, I think it's a good sign that he-, he found his game again. You know, I think Alex Smith was the single biggest problem they had. That's not to say he's the only problem, but if he plays well again like that for the rest of the season, I think they win games again. Um, maybe not all of them, but I think they're, they're winning games and they're, they're good enough to beat a team like the Raiders, in particular at home. Big issue with Kansas City, though. They play so much man coverage. Yeah, and now they don't have any cornerbacks. Yeah. We've been talking about the number two corner all season. Uh, Marcus Peters suspended as Probably. well because he fired that, fired that flag that landed on Alex Mack. And then walked out of the, uh, in that out of the funny game. Video, walked out of the game. So... Even when Marcus Peters is on the field, though, the story is still the number two cornerback spot. Darrell Revis comes in, and they <laughs> limit him to 36 snaps while he's just trying to find his way. Still doesn't look like the old Revis. Probably not. Just trying to surprising. shake off the cobwebs. The cobwebs. All right, I don't like doing this because it's silly, but <laughs> on camera, Darrell Revis looked a little chunky. He looked like he was carrying a little bit of a gut. With the, you know, the skin-tight mesh uniform, you know what I mean? There was a little bit of substance to the midriff. Yeah, I'm just saying, if, if you came off your couch in early December... Oh, sure, but like the big thing about Revis is last year was a big step backwards, and one of the question marks was how much did he want it, how much was he truly motivated, how much was he carrying extra weight, all these questions. And you're thinking, well, if he shakes off all that, potentially you have a different player. Now, if nothing else, he looks like the same weight than he was last year, which is... a, a by all accounts, heavier than he'd been yeah, throughout not the rest a good, of his career. Not a good spot to be. All I'm saying is I don't think he's back 15 pounds lighter than he was last year and back to full quickness. So if he's not the answer, mm-hmm. uh, this, is, this is where there's a major issue for Kansas City. They like to play man coverage. There's no Eric Berry to match up with tight ends. That's been all season. The number two cornerback spot has been an issue. Steven Nelson's been up and down. Uh, that's why they're being torched in the pass game, and also you don't have that same pass rush getting after the quarterback as they have in, in recent years. Yeah, well, the last time they played the Raiders this season, Amari Cooper went off for 11 catches, 210 yards, two touchdowns, all of which came against cornerbacks not named Marcus Peters. So he beat Terrence Mitchell for four catches, 76 yards, and a touchdown. He beat Philip Gaines for four catches, 46 yards. Um, he beat Daniel Sorensen for 84 yards and a touchdown. So basically, he did all that damage against guys that weren't Marcus Peters. Now Marcus Peters isn't there, so there's nobody on the defense that can go against Amari Cooper in theory and shut him down. And now, but we're both taking Kansas City. So personally, I'm banking on this being a little bit of a shootout, like it was the last time around. And I think you know Alex Smith finding his rhythm. When you look at his season being so good early, so bad in the middle. Alex Smith is somewhere in between those two. I think he finishes the season 
somewhere in between those two. And I think they find enough of a groove in the passing game. They showed it last week with Tyree Kill and the deep ball and just, I mean, the terrible quarters coverage that the Jets were playing. But yeah. I think they're going to get back on track with that Kansas City offense these next few weeks. Yeah, generally speaking, you should come up with a defense that doesn't put a guy one-on-one with Tyreek Hill deep down the field all the time. Every single time. And he was, and that was like college separation. Yeah. That was, well, those were college throws where we're, we're almost like not downgrading quarterbacks, but being like, ah, that'll never happen at the NFL level. You're not going to have that type of separation. Like the one thing that you, you would say about Rashad Robinson coming out is, man, that guy has recovery speed for days. Not enough to recover against Tyreek Hill when you screwed it up. Yeah, ugly, ugly play. Um, but I'm expecting Kansas City's offense to, uh, yeah, to find their groove again. That's why I'm taking them against Oakland, whose defense has been uh, w- w- as bad as Kansas City's defense has been at times. That's been Oakland for the majority of the season. Yeah, Marshawn Lynch's first 100-yard game of the season last week. In fact, the more numbers that I look at surrounding this game, the less confident I am in having picked the Chiefs. Um, I'm with you there, too, <laughs> actually, the more I look <laughs> at it. Uh, I will say... One of my predictions was that they were going to unleash Lynch late in the season. I thought that was how this whole process yeah. was going to go for Oakland. Like, ease him in, have control of the AFC West, or at least be close, and then uh, drop the hammer later in the year. Maybe this is where Marshawn does his most damage. I think he's st- I think he's been playing reasonably well all season. It just hasn't had the production. A little bit like Kareem Hunt in Kansas City. I don't think he's been the problem in that running game. Um, only the difference being there that you know the offensive line is, hasn't exactly been bad. They've got a good offensive line. Just for whatever reason, they haven't found that groove of opening up huge holes for him consistently. I think Lynch, uh, this last quarter of the season, though, something to keep an eye on if Oakland is going to make a run. Uh, let's go to one more game before our little halftime break. San Francisco 49ers at the Houston Texans. Jimmy Garoppolo, we talked about him, Zach and I, on the QB podcast. Go check it out. He, uh, we kicked off the podcast with some uh, Jimmy G discussion, broke down his game in depth. It was a pretty clean outing for him, made a number of nice throws under pressure, showed good accuracy, managed the game well. He'll be facing Tom Savage in the Houston Texans. What are you seeing in this one, Sam? Yeah, I, so Jimmy Garoppolo definitely looks like a very good quarterback, or certainly did last week. Um, that being said, they still barely squeaked by the Chicago Bears. Only who, scored 15 points. Who were yeah. terrible. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's it's not transformed them into this juggernaut that's going to roll over everybody. Um, the Houston Texans uh, struggled <laughs> against uh, against the, the Titans. They but Their big thing is being able to contain those running backs, that the same threat isn't there for the 49ers. You know, they're not going to get run on the way they were this past week. Um, so I think this actually becomes a pretty close game. And for as much as they're a completely different unit with Tom Savage at quarterback than they were with Deshaun Watson at quarterback because of all the different things that Deshaun Watson lets you do, I don't think Savage has actually been that bad when you consider just how terrible that offensive line is in Houston. I mean, that is the league's worst offensive line. Um, it's been an absolute disaster there's nobody playing well in either facet of the game, really. This past week against Tennessee, there's just horrendous grades across the board. Um, and yet Tom Savage actually played okay. I think there's a half chance they sneak this game out. Yeah, look, I don't think it's crazy. I mean, we're talking about the 49ers here. Um, and I'm all, I also, even on the podcast with Zach, I, wasn't, I brought up plenty, plenty of question marks to Garoppolo's game. The cat and mouse game between Garoppolo and and opposing defensive coordinators every single week I think is going to be the interesting one to watch because he's got some of that, you know, he's really good in the middle of the field. I want to see if defensive coordinators start to force him to throw the ball on the outside. For for Houston, the defense, you know, still concerning just how they've managed uh, all of their injuries. Brian Cushing coming back now. I don't know how much he ends up contributing with uh, Benardrick McKinney and uh, Zach Cunningham in the middle there, but um, they they haven't had the same type of pass rush up front with all of their top talent down and Jadavian Clowney, you know, still that guy. If you're if you're the Houston Texans and you're watching something down the stretch here, what is Clowney? You know, consistently week in week out. Last week only one pressure and uh, still a lot of games like that. You know, in his career where he just you know one pressure, two pressures instead of that that you want him at that Von Miller and Khalil Mack just consistent five, six, ten pressure games. And we just don't see that every single week from Clowney. Yeah, three games this season where Clowney has had just a single solitary pressure. That's what I'm watching for in that game. But I'm going. uh, I'm going San Francisco. I think Garoppolo continues to improve and uh, you know gives the 49ers a chance. 
Yeah, I'm going with the Texans. So has, well, both the, the, the boss, Chris Collinsworth, and Jeff Radcliffe, the guy that's leading the PFF picks. We're all on the Houston bandwagon. So you're going with the boss and the leader. Yep. Smart move. I gotta keep my uh, keep my bases covered. Quick break to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by PredictionMachine.com. Prediction Machine, a new generation in sports analytics, where they play the game fifty thousand times before they're actually played. Make better picks with proven data driven analysis. Subscribe at PredictionMachine.com today and earn a five dollar credit that can be used towards the purchase of any package. Now let's go to our friends Eric and George C. For your lock of the week. That's right, guys. They are 10 and 3. Be sure to listen up for this one. All righty. Thank you, guys. It is week 14, lock of the week time. I'm George, joined by Eric over there in lonely, cheese curd filled Wisconsin. How's everything going? Good, man. We um, had a you know nice week last week in terms of our lock of the week. We, we had New Orleans uh, minus four and a half, and that was you know something of a sweat, but we got there and then. Uh, I don't know. Thursday night, we we correctly picked Atlanta, I guess, over New Orleans, despite uh, all the Dan Quinniness uh, that we could handle. So um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it's been a decent week so far. It's a bit of an understatement to say that we handled it because maybe you're calm, but uh, I don't know, riled me up a little bit, <laughs> a couple of times. Um, out Ryan didn't help things out either, but. Uh, yeah, thank- there were there were Skype messages from both of us that said something to the effect of "What is going on?" Uh, at least three to four times in that game. Yeah, which is like on my side of things a low number, but um, when you get involved, you know something's gone wrong. Anyways, that's exactly what the the five listeners want to hear. Um, so let's move on from things that have already happened to things that hopefully will happen in the future we are picking against a team for the second time this this year um and the first time it happened in london so you know sort of doesn't count this time we're traveling to jacksonville taking the seahawks they are getting two and a half points against blake bortles the jacksonville jaguars um it seems ridiculous so what are we what could we potentially be overlooking um, that would make this one go the wrong way. So you're saying if I pick a, a game against the spread in a different time zone, it doesn't technically count. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anything counts in uh, in you know in England because they have like a king and a queen. It's like a fairy tale. I don't know. They're gotcha. Princes and yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. I mean, like we've we struggled over which game to pick this week because we really liked you know this one, but there were you know clear reasons why. This could go wrong. I think, you know, probably obvious to the listeners, just that Jacksonville has one of, if not the best defenses in the league, um, especially on the back end, covering um, with, you know, the Jalen Ramseys of the world, uh, the A.J. Boyes. And Seattle so far this year has really established themselves as a passing team um, with Doug Baldwin and, and um, uh, Jimmy Graham and, and the Paul Richardson's playing extremely well, uh, catching passes from Russell Wilson. So, you know, on one hand, if, if Jacksonville mitigates that, um, they can have some success. But when you dig deeper, that's kind of the only thing that Jacksonville has in this one, right? Uh, I don't know. Are you uh, just totally overlooking the second coming of Ben Roethlisberger? Uh, well, I do. OK, so fa- sure. Bortles has <laughs> never picked incorrectly against the spread in a lock of the week segment. I will give him that. So I'm not going to judge the guy. Um, but yeah, I'm a little bearish on, on Blake Bortles. Yeah. So, I mean, look, the, the Jacksonville defense is fantastic, but when you look at the other side of things, the Seattle defense certainly is no slouch. Um, they're all grading pretty well. And even the guys that are stepping in for Sherman and Chancellor, um, you know, are still doing a great job. Bobby Wagner is incredible. Obviously Thomas, um, and then, you know, you think about, okay, the defense on both sides plays well. Where does the game, you know, wh- where does the edge come from? And you've got Russell Wilson against Blake Bortles. Russell Wilson leads the NFL in, you know, our highest graded throws, big time throws. Blake Bortles, on the other hand, 
you know, is averaging, you know, the fewest yards per attempt on, on deep throws this year. So I think there's a pretty sizable difference between a guy that is probably headed straight for, for Canton and, uh, Blake Bortles, who is Blake Bortles. <laughs> simply looks like somebody else that's heading straight to Canton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I think you make a great point, and, and what's interesting, and you bring up Seattle's defense. You know, Seattle's defense in our metrics is kind of in the same cluster as the Jacksonville defense, and Seattle's faced a slightly tougher schedule this year uh, to date uh, than Jacksonville has. Um, the injuries matter, but um, you know, if you if you consider those two kind of in a in a similar equivalence class, then it does boil down to the quarterbacks um, or the offenses in general. And I think Seattle's offense is trending in the right direction. Since week nine, their offensive line, which has been much maligned, um, has gotten a couple players back in Justin Britt and Dwayne Brown, um, have the fifth highest pass blocking efficiency among, among, offensive linemen, uh, among offensive lines in the league. And that's with a quarterback that you know, takes a decent amount of time to throw the ball. Um, running the football last week against the Eagles defense, who's giving up the fourth fewest yards per attempt in the league, uh, Seattle got 100 yards on four yards of carry. So, you know, Jacksonville's defense isn't as nearly as good at stopping the run as the Eagles are. And so I think Seattle has the horses offensively to move the ball and to, um, you know, I think at least match wits with Jacksonville's defense. And then so then you go to the other side of the ball. And as we've described, uh, Bortles is probably not going to be up to the task on that side. Yeah. Um, just to back those those two things up. So Russell Wilson is been under pressure more than any other quarterback since he entered the league but over those you know last um five weeks with Dwayne Brown under pressure at just barely above the league average 36 percent while holding on to the ball for the longest amount of time 3.2 uh seconds on average so clearly some improvement there which you know only means more opportunity for Russ Wilson to do kind of the crazy, amazing things that he does in and out of the pocket. Um, so, you know, if we lose taking Russell Wilson against Blake Bortles, so be it. Uh, willing willing to, to ride with that one. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, we've taken, if, if we're going to be 10-4 and four after this week and two of them are against Blake Bortles, um, you know, those are the types of players, no, no offense to him, that you want to bet against. So, um yeah, I think I think we're on the right side here, and and um, hopefully hopefully we're right. You're tempting fate. You, uh, you know, just outwardly called out that you don't like Blake Bortles, and you used equivalence class, uh, maligned. It was like a I needed a thesaurus here. To, to maligned <laughs> offensive line. Good God. Yeah. So there were four listeners when we started this segment. There are now no. zero. Uh, so it seems like a good opportunity to turn it back to uh, the the main pod. Um, if you want more of our picks, head to the website. We've got our column up with uh, five picks. And then if you want all of them against spread and over-unders, PFF Elite is where you need to go, profootballfocus.com. Um, that's all I've if got. If you want Mike's crappy bets, uh, at PFF underscore Mike. Wow, that sounds incredible. I would definitely hit that up. Take it all. All right. We'll head back to the podcast. Lock it up. You lock it up. Thanks, guys. Great insight as always. All right, Sam, we got a few more games to fly through. Let's go to an NFC East battle that's lost a little bit of luster. And actually, can you believe this game got flexed out? The Dallas Cowboys at the New York Giants. It used to be the the 4 o'clock game, Aikman and Buck. Flexed out for the Seahawks and the Jags. Not your 1999 Jags or my 1999 Jags. <laughs> the 2017 Jaguars. Anyway, the Cowboys at the Giants. The Cowboys are one of those other NFC teams just sitting at 6-6 six and six with their uh, career on the line. Now, their season on the line. Uh, what are you seeing with this one, Cowboys-Giants? Well, this is the Eli Manning revenge game. He's back in the saddle. We get some Aerosmith music going there. Eli back in the saddle. The only thing that's gone is the start streak. Um, are well, we going to see a motivated a one? Are we going to see an angry, motivated Eli out here to prove a point and kick some ass? That's what I want to know. No. No? I think we're going to see the same, same old Eli. Eli. Yeah. Disinterested, slightly goofy looking. 
not really having any of it. Yeah, throw probably, some ducks. Yeah, probably overthrow some passes over the middle. And uh, Underrated part of Eli's game this year is red zone. He's been one of the top red zone quarterbacks this year. That, that's why he's been actually good when he's been out there. Pretty good in the red zone, pretty good on third down. And that's kind of the reason why Eli's been better this year than in recent years. There is one reason and one reason only to watch this game. And that is Damon Harrison against the Dallas Cowboys. No, two reasons. You're right. Very good point. I'm pointing to Des Bryant's PD. <laughs> There's right. Damon Harrison against the Dallas interior offensive line group because that's the big reason. I mean, honestly, watching Damon Harrison on any if you can get him watch you know on the the end zone cam of all 22 footage, you know the game pass when it comes up, watch him on end zone cam. Just watch the things he does against offensive linemen. It is obscene. There's nobody else in the NFL capable of doing what he does. On a down to down basis. No matter what Warren Sapp says about him, he's <laughs> awesome. Kelechi Assembly is probably the like the strongest guard in the league, just in terms of brute force, consistently manhandling people. Damon Harrison was throwing him around like he was just a regular guard, like a regular strength guard. Right. He was tossing him around. So that is amazing to watch because those Dallas guys are pretty formidable. The other reason, as you so rightly pointed out, was the Des Bryant PD watch. He just needs he's slipping behind the rest of the cornerback field now in terms of Pass breakups, PDs. So he needs to get a couple more. Uh, rip the ball out of the hands of some defensive backs. It's on Dak, really. I mean, Dak needs to force more passes to him. Yeah. Uh, Dak tried. Dak gave him <laughs> uh, an underthrown, two underthrown end zone passes, one of which Dez turned into a touchdown selfishly. Yeah, I know. Uh, another one that was a pass interference where Dez was unable to actually get to the ball to break it up. Actually, do we claim, will we claim the touchdown one as a PD? We could claim that. I as wouldn't a PD, say it's right? like a pure intercept you know interception worthy play no i mean we would have i'd have to look at it again we would have to we would have to give the corner a better chance of catching it than des and him having taken it away from the guy you may not have heard zach on the podcast though but you know you know zach played with des right you know yeah and and zach threw fades to des left and right yeah and he texts me after that and he goes Dak just doesn't know how to throw those balls to des he just doesn't know where des likes those passes and even though Des caught it for a touchdown, he did leave it a little bit too far inside. But we're no, we're not giving him the PD. We're not. Uh, I'm with you. Let's watch the trenches. Travis Frederick, Zach Martin uh, going up against Damon Harrison twice a year. We're actually treated to this. And if you are a fan of center play, guard play, nose tackle play, this is the game for you. Eli Revenge Tour, big picture for Dallas. Dak has struggled these last few weeks. They won the other day, and he's not been good. So uh, what I, I want to see Dak – get back to form. It, my favorite part about his rookie season was how he handled adversity. I think he's facing adversity right now, and it's time for him to step it up and show what he did last year. Also, Alfred Morris has been actually very productive in the place of uh, Ezekiel Elliott. In fact, more productive than Ezekiel Elliott in certain statistics. You have a piece on the website right now uh, by Austin Gale that looks at the product- uh, the production that Alfred Morris has had. So, you know, as, as concerned as people were about the, the impact that losing Zeke Elliott had, I don't think it's actually been that big of one. I think Dak has struggled, but it hasn't been because they don't have Zeke Elliott there anymore. I think part of it was when they lost. I think Tyron Smith was a much bigger hole for them. Absolutely. Um, but the yeah. line has been an issue. But there's clearly yeah, there's clearly a difference in the receivers this year too. Cole Beasley, Dez, uh, Terrence Williams, Jason Witten, just not getting open the way they were last year. And Dax, this sounds simple, but Dak is one of the better throwers in the NFL to open receivers. That was one of the things that we charted uh, coming out of college where he's really good. So that's what I'll be watching down the stretch here for Dallas is how that offense uh, bounces back here. Who you got in this one, Sam? Dallas. I also have the Cowboys. It looks like everybody at PFF has the Cowboys, except for Zach. Yeah. Except for Zach. Still no faith in Dak bouncing back. All right. Is this a game this week? All right, next game, Sam. Jets traveling to the Broncos. Give me something good to watch in this one. Look, um, Josh McCown is fun to watch these days. He is. You know, he's chucking some YOLO balls, and sometimes they're landing in Robbie Anderson's hands for some big plays. Robbie Anderson is playing pretty spectacularly well. He is, I mean, he's basically, he's always been a deep threat, um, but now he's a little bit more than a deep threat. You know, he's developing his game He's developing it from that, which is a strange starting point, you know, to just be a deep threat only and then become a broader weapon as a receiver. But that's what he's doing, doing it pretty well. But Josh McCown's actually making some big plays himself. It's not all Fitzpatrick style YOLO balls. And, oh, I agree. And the whole thing relying on basically just your receivers being better than the other guys for a while to make you look good. He's actually playing pretty well. Yeah. McCown 
you know, he does have the ability to add positive plays to the offense is the way to put it. It's about him uh, avoiding those mistakes. Uh, Denver's offense, man, just tough to watch. The quarterback situation has been a disaster. The offensive line is one of the worst in the NFL. Uh, I don't know if they have the same dynamic playmakers at the wide receiver position between Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. If, you know, that combination with the way Simeon, Osweiler, and Paxton Lynch have played when those guys have rotated in and out, uh, it's just trouble in Denver right now. Yeah, their quarterback situation makes me sad. Um, I mean, I said, I can't remember when I said this to you before. It may have been on the podcast, but if you put all three of those guys together and took only the best traits from each one, you still wouldn't have a viable quarterback. Man, that's, that's not good. That's rough. Look, Simeon was not supposed to be this bad. No. Coming in. It, and I was a. I was that was from a low ex- yeah, that was right? from a low starting point. Right. It was like Simeon's not really the guy that you want to be the starter, but you didn't expect him to like completely lose games for you. Yeah. There was at least this hope that he could manage games enough, and he did that those first few weeks. Um, so I still picked Denver, you know, the home field advantage deal, uh, the fact that Denver's defense, even though they've uh you know, they've been really inconsistent these last few weeks. They got thirty five points to the Dolphins. Yeah, I get it. I get it. They're no I I keep to leave. You know, when he's out there, Chris Harris is out there. Uh, Justin Simmons still playing pretty well back there. You still have Vaughn Miller rushing off the edge. You, you need a compliment to him, but the talent is still there in defense. I, but again, going back to what we said before the season, I don't know if the new scheme is a perfect match for that. They've got some figuring out to do on the defensive side this offseason, but I'm picking them because I do think they're talented enough to uh, to get by this week. How much do you do you th- how bad do you think it is being like the one good lineman on an offensive line that's horrendous? Like if you're Matt Paradis and you yeah. go out there week after week and you're like, "Well, I'm fine. The rest of you guys suck." Do you think he runs around with his PFF grade around the uh the locker room? I don't think he could do that when it's like one guy on four. I think that's risky. Yeah, we had Ronald Leary with him for uh, much of the year. Yeah, but I think now you just have to be silent rage for the whole time. You know, you go into these meeting rooms and you're like, "Well, look, I'm I'm doing okay here. You guys are ruining things. Like I'm great in the '80s. The rest of you, pick it up. Yeah. Why Why are your grades in the '40s? Are you taking the Jets? Uh, I am. Is it because of McCown? Is it because? I think this, it's a this emerging that. passing game because again, my all the fantasy guys on my timeline keep reminding me <laughs> that McCown is like a top five fantasy quarterback over these last few weeks because he is making some downfield plays. So we talked earlier in the season about how crazy it was for Alex Smith to be having like a career year, ten years into his career, um, and then that sort of fell away. And I don't know if it actually is a career year for him anymore. At least not unless he pulls it back up to where he was earlier for the na- the, the remainder of the games. Um, PFF doesn't go back as far as the early seasons of Josh McCown's career, but it wouldn't shock me if this was a career year for Josh McCown as well. Certainly if you throw out the 2013 half season with the quarterback whisperer in Chicago right. that like extended his career by another five years. Um, but for him to be able to have the best season of his career, at least the past decade, this old is remarkable. Like, And he's... I'm, I like seeing Josh McCown do well because he's a guy who seems like a genuinely nice guy. We met him on the training camp tour. He went out of his way to come up to us on the sideline after practice and say how much he appreciates what PFF does. And this is at the time where he, know that. And this was at the time where he was grading like crap at PFF. So he was coming up to us telling us how much he appreciated the work we do, you know, grading guys and all the stuff we do for football, despite us grading him like. Like garbage at the time. <laughs> that I think says, speaks to speaks to the guy. You know, he was happy to sort of talk about watching film with us and coming out and all that kind of stuff. So I I, I like Josh McCown. I'm happy he's doing well. We'll have to get him out here then. Yeah, that was a little different from my conversation with Ryan Fitzpatrick when him and I both <laughs> did the same show with uh, Chris, the yeah. Super Bowl preview, and I was I cited a quarterback, you know, quarterbacks being elevated by their playmakers in the same year that Brandon Marshall may have kind of carried Fitz. Yeah. I didn't get the same reaction from Fitz. Anyway, you're taking the Jets. I'm taking Denver. We got to move on. We're going to Tennessee, taking on the Arizona Cardinals. Blaine Gabbert sacked seven times last week. Some ugly plays from him. He kicked, he kicked off the game with a bad interception, then had a pick six. I don't know if Gabbert's the answer in Arizona. I talked about this with Zach. You hear these quotes from Bruce Arians. I don't think they really believe that Gabbert's the future. Not looking great. Right Hang now. on. You don't know if Gabbard is the solution in Arizona. No, but 
Arians is saying things like he might be, and people are ta- people are writing about this and talking about this. Like, here's a trial run for Blaine Gabbert, but like, yeah, but you, you can't just go out there and say, "Look, this is the guy we're stuck with right now. We're rolling with it." You got to uh, say something positive. Yeah, I brought this up the other day, though. What happens when Bruce Arians is looking for another job and he's interviewing, and the and the guy's like, "Wait a second, you were believing in Blaine Gabbert." Well, then you, you were say, Blaine Gabbert "I wasn't. I was just saying that because just I can't come out and say, player. look." I got this crap bag that I'm stuck with, and I've got to run with him for the next four games. Well, I had to build up his confidence a little bit. You didn't have to be that harsh, Sam. I'm just saying. All right, talk to me about Tennessee. And uh, it's it's been a weird season for Marcus Mariota. Has not played nearly as poorly as the stats would show. Uh, making a lot of big-time throws, just not enough. That, that down-to-down consistency isn't there as far as all the positives, but he's really high in our big-time throw numbers. Uh, but those are the passes they're getting dropped, or they're just, you know, you know, we've got some unlucky interceptions in there. It's just a weird season for Mariota. So the offense looks really inconsistent, uh, and the defense still scares me as far as what they're capable of down the stretch and into the playoffs. I think the defense has really started to come on. I think they've improved dramatically. Um, the secondary, in particular, which was a big question mark heading into the season, has started to really come together. Obviously, Kevin Byard has been the guy that's made all the highlight reel interceptions I think for they've them. just played Jacoby Brissett, <laughs> and they've played Tom Savage. That's what's coming. That's coming together these last two weeks. But I think Adoree Jackson has been playing better. I think Logan no, that's true. Ryan has been playing better. Suddenly that secondary has actually started to improve, and it was always a lot was resting on young shoulders. Right. And that could go one of two ways. Those guys can either develop as you hope they will, or they can kind of go in the tank a bit and look like young and experienced players, and then you have problems. So I think that's moving in the right direction. Um, and and is actually one of the strengths of this team. Delaney Walker on the offensive side is one of the best tight ends in the game. Um, How far away from the Hall of Fame right now is is Corey Davis and his uh, rookie season? Oh, man, what do we have for... uh, We got two receptions last week. So uh, that's... Uh, We're creeping creeping towards Hall of Fame status. It's too closer to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, so for those of you just tuning in, go check out our draft episodes way back. Uh, (laughs) my, My bold prediction was that Corey Davis would have top 10 reception numbers by the end of his career career receptions Corey i mean Davis. he's 22 down right now that's practically there already yeah he's got 22 in the bag uh yeah okay my prediction's not looking great in here in this no, rookie not right season, now. but i got faith i got faith in Corey davis if he can emerge man he's got all the skills uh keenan allen was my comp for him coming out keenan allen who is tearing it up now for the chargers that you know, slipperiness off the line of scrimmage, the ability to win in the big game down, you know, down the field in the intermediate game. Corey Davis's emergence, that is what would help Mariota's stats probably match up with the way he's playing. Rashard Matthews probably doesn't get enough credit for being a pretty good receiver. In fact, he might be the last good seventh round pick. We, we had that talk in the mailbag episode. Oh, of there we go. How many seventh round picks would you need to give to give up the number one overall? Rashad Matthews might be the last decent seventh round to actually turn out. An efficient 2012 seventh round pick. Is he a Thomas Jones? No, I think he's better than a Thomas Jones. He's better? Well, yeah. he's better than a late era Thomas Jones, which is when that question turned up. He may be a peak era Thomas Jones. You know, actually a pretty good player. Who so then... he could easily regress back into Thomas Jones, <laughs> yeah. just get what's expected. Exactly, yeah. I like it. We're both taking Tennessee here. Is anybody taking Arizona in our crew? Yes. Somebody is. Mike Renner. Mike. That's probably why he's bailed on We're going to have to phone him in from his uh, special assignment to figure out why he's taking Arizona. But the uh, Gabbert scares me. It's the hair, isn't it? That's why Mike's picking Arizona. Yeah. He sees in Blaine Gabbert a kindred spirit, a man who also has flowing hair. He's got to pick Arizona for the rest of the year then. Yeah. He's locked in. All right. We got other 4 o'clock games. Hey, you and I are going to split some analysis on this one. Washington Redskins traveling to the Los Angeles Chargers. Your first place Chargers, Sam. They're tied for first as well with Oakland and Kansas City. What are you seeing in this one? Chargers are rolling. They're not on the tiebreaker, though, do they? They're second place at the moment. They're all still. first place. They're all six and six. <laughs> Tiebreakers don't matter in week 13, heading into week 14. Of course they do. No. That's, that's, how they, that's how you separate them. If the playoffs ended today. Well, they're not first place. They're second place with the same record as the first place team. Oh, my God. What do you see anyway? Well, they're better than they were before. Um, Casey Hayward, thank you. Casey Hayward, I think, has been as good as any corner in the league this year. I think it says a lot that he held up as well as he did against Josh Gordon, with Josh Gordon getting 11 targets in his first time back. Yeah, Josh Gordon is a spectacular talent, and one of those receptions, he was in, you know, Casey Hayward was in good coverage. Gordon just went up over the top of him, took it away in a pretty spectacular play. 
So, you know, Casey Hayward is a legit number one corner, which continues to amaze me for a guy who the Packers didn't think was capable of playing outside. You know, not just being a number one corner. They didn't think he could play out of the slot. I mean, a lot of teams didn't believe in him. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not them uh, alone, but they had him on the roster when they didn't believe that. Um, But he has emerged not just into a top starting corner, he's emerged into one of the best number one corners in the game. Um, Hunter Henry, their second tight end slash first tight end now, has emerged into the the sort of next, you know, the replacement for Antonio Gates, the the number one target that, that he can be. Obviously, Philip Rivers still getting it done despite the advanced age. That's the bus helping him. That baller bus that he has with the giant TV to watch oh, film and cruise up and down to San Diego every day. Zach talked about we, we discussed his on field play mm-hmm. the other day about you know the decision making and some of the stuff they could do just you know taking out a couple of those bone headed decisions per game that he was you know making last year. Didn't talk about the bus though. Got to talk about the bus and how that's uh, keeping him healthy. So that's yeah, that's good. Who you got in this one? Who do I got? I have Keenan got... Allen, by the way, is on fire. Yes. And that pass offense is dangerous. So I know I'm going Chargers. Keenan Allen is one of the best route runners in the NFL right now. Um, he's got some scary quickness, yes. the ability to make a guy move in the wrong direction. He's always had that. Just no, I know. Just keep staying healthy. Uh, yeah, I've got the Chargers as well. So has everybody, in fact, except Neil. Neil Hornsby has the Reds. Neil randomly taken Washington. All right, that game that was flexed into the 4 o'clock window, Seattle Seahawks at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Jacksonville, uh, we like to call them Seattle Southeast or something like that, right? They've built that defense. We do? I do. I just did. Uh, They're building that defense the same way Seattle built theirs with Jalen Ramsey playing the role of Richard Sherman. Still looking for their Earl Thomas, but essentially they're playing a similar scheme, cover three, cover one, four-man rush, let those guys – Get after the quarterback, Calais Campbell and Yannick Ngakwe and uh, you know Malik Jackson and Dante Fowler. All these guys that can get after the quarterback. What are you seeing here? This is one of the best defenses in the league in Jackson. It really is. They've been building something special for a while, and every year it didn't work out. Um, but this is like the year that all the previous seasons worth of building has come together as one. Yep. Um, it's not just what they added this offseason that's working out. It's everything they've done over the past two or three years has all come together at the same time and created this pretty spectacular-looking defense. The Seahawks are coming off this huge game, though, where they just knocked off what was the number one team in the NFC with a monster performance at home. The question for them is, can they then back that up with a game against a team that a lot of people see as pretenders still? But in order to prove that, Seattle has to travel across the country um, and, and make that same kind of statement on the road. The big thing for them is that they have been dramatically better protecting Russell Wilson since the arrival of Dwayne Brown. Yep. But that's going to be tested against maybe the best pass rushing group in the NFL, which is exactly the same story as it was a week ago with Philadelphia coming to town. Yeah, this is two straight weeks of a really difficult assignment for the Seattle O-line. Yeah, but it held up well against that Philadelphia defensive front. Realistically, the offensive line wasn't a major problem in that game. Um, There were a lot of plays where Russell Wilson was running for his life, but a lot of them... I mean, he was the reason he was running for his life. Right. You know, he does. We talked about this before in the pod, the, the review podcast, and he does a lot of stuff that quarterbacks are not supposed to do because he's kind of comfortable with that happening. Um, so you're going to see him on, under duress a lot. A lot of that is kind of deliberate. It's not the offensive line causing the problems. It's him just accepting that this is a pretty good way of playing, and he knows how to get it done in that in that way. I think this is a really fascinating matchup. I'm, I'm genuinely curious to see if Seattle can prove they're still legit because this is a game they could, if you know Philadelphia is now playing the Rams, they could tie at the top of this division if they can go on the road and make a statement. Yeah, so this is uh, definitely the matchup I want to watch. Russell Wilson and that offense going up against the Jags defense. Probably going to come down to what's happening on the other side, though. You still have Blake Bortles, who they want to protect. They want to run the ball. He had a really nice week last week thrown to guys like D.D. Westbrook and Marquise Lee and Keelan Cole. So Jacksonville has shown this potential offensively, but it still comes down to this roller coaster ride that is Bortles. But last week, best game of the week, best best game of the season for him against the Colts. Last week is like the weirdest week ever for quarterbacks. The two quarterbacks at the top of the list vying for this play, the place on team of the week were Blake Bortles and Joe Flacco. Yes, I love when you're just waiting for that that final grade to come through the final grade lock is it going to be Flacco is it going to be Bortles I mean who, we're debating everybody wins 
regardless of who it is. No matter who's up at the top. So that's a matchup I'm gonna, matchup I'm going to be watching. Uh, Seattle's defense, even without Richard Sherman, without Cam Chancellor, still extremely good. Your boy Shaq Griffin playing well back there. So Seattle traveling across the country, Sam. Who do you have? Jacksonville. I don't have faith in the Seahawks doing the same thing on the road. I guess I do because I, I took Seattle. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I just think December – Seattle Seahawks. We've seen this trend before, and even without the proper personnel, you still have Wilson. You still have Bobby Wagner, top-graded linebacker in the entire NFL. I'm taking Seattle to make a statement in Jacksonville. Didn't Never thought we'd say that yeah. before the season, but I'm loving this game. Another game I'm loving, Philadelphia Eagles at the Los Angeles Rams. It is Wentz Goff 1, Sam, or is it Goff Wentz 1? Uh, it's got to be Goff Wentz, Goff I guess. Wentz, Goff was picked first. And he's at home. Yeah, but the home team's usually... Well, that's something because you guys do it backwards here. Everything you guys do is backwards from the dates to the just everything. Anyway, Philadelphia at Los Angeles. People are already writing articles. The Eagles were pretenders and all this stuff. It's like, guys, they just lost their second game. It's okay. It was at Seattle. Yeah. It's okay. You got to wait until after this week to write that. Uh, I still... and I, I like Philadelphia. I picked the Rams, though, because every time mm. I'm ready to write off the Rams, <laughs> they step up. They make it. They 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 play a, a a solid game. The offense, McVay can game plan with the best of them. I think he's going to have a good game plan against this Philadelphia defense. I think he will too. Um, this I this was the swing that Philadelphia needed to figure out. It's going to tell us a lot about the Eagles. And at the moment, all we have is an incomplete. You know, they went up. They played a close game against a very tough Seahawks defense or Seahawks team that was on fire, and the game really hinged on a fumble that could have tied the game and been a completely different outcome. So I don't think we've really learned anything out of that game other than the fact that the Seahawks are still capable this year. This is the big game, though, because if the Eagles come out of this two-game West Coast swing with two defeats against two legitimate NFC foes, that's a pretty significant blow to them. You know that They, were, may have been, they weren't in danger of getting carried away with themselves or anything, but suddenly you've taken a real smack in the teeth and you have to reevaluate if you really think you can win the Super Bowl having been knocked off by two other strong teams in, in the conference. So almost for that reason alone, I think this Philadelphia team is legit. I think that defense is formidable. Um, it's going to do a good job against that, offensive, that offense in uh, Los Angeles. I don't think Jared Goff has the same kind of capability to just do ridiculous things and make plays in the face of stupid pressure the way Russell Wilson was. You know, he's not able right. to run around for five minutes in the backfield and still deliver a pass to somebody and make good things happen out of it. Um, if he's going to get joy out of that, it's going to have to come in a different way. And I think the Eagles are better equipped to, to, to patch that up. And the offense is still good. You know, it's still able to scheme against a good defense. It's still able to have success with RPOs and that kind of stuff. I think, I think this is the game they get it back on track and they end up one on one out of their uh, West Coast wing. Yeah, I was really torn on this game. Like I said, I ultimately took the Rams, but I, I think the real key could be that Eagles run game against the Rams defensive front. You know, Aaron Donald. We talked to Warren Sapp the other day. He talks about Aaron Donald getting upfield a little bit too much, and you know, you could be trapped. That nobody runs as many traps. I, I just, um, I can't say it like that. I can't do the nobody runs as many traps as this team without actually without having actually looking for it. <laughs> without actually having it. Checking. I'm it. not doing that. I refuse to do that. Okay. Announcers do that all the time. They we do. can't have it. But the Eagles run a lot of traps. <laughs> okay, how about that? They're going to they're gonna try to trap Aaron Donald. In other words, use that momentum against him. The Eagles have a very creative running game. And there, there are certain formations. You have Ethan Westbrooks, who's like an undersized nose tackle for the Rams. And uh, he can get blown off the ball quite a bit. Uh, Alec Ogletree last week had a disastrous game against the run, taking on blocks. They play a lot of man coverage. For the Rams, and when you play man coverage, you can kind of manipulate that with the run game. So I think that's going to be the key for Philadelphia is being able to, uh, as much as you know, Carson Wentz makes those big plays and everything. The run game could really control the action for Philadelphia. Uh, if they can't, though, I do like the Rams getting after the quarterback a little bit and uh, like the way Goff is is playing. So I'm taking the Rams, and you're taking the Eagles. We'll see. Be a fun game in the four o'clock window. Two more to get through quickly. Baltimore Ravens at Pittsburgh Steelers. Your favorite little AFC North crazy matchup. Don't shake your head, Sam. You love this. The Steelers continue to find ways to win. They're 10-2. and two. Baltimore trending really well. Flacco coming off his best game since probably 2012. 
and their defense playing really, really well. What are you seeing in this one? Yeah, big losses for both these teams, though. Um, the Ravens lost Jimmy Smith to their torn Achilles. Uh, no, no. It's and just a suspension. And a four-game suspension. And the suspension. He's doing both. But he was busy appealing that. He wouldn't Same have got time. suspended yet if he hadn't torn his Achilles. Um, and the Steelers lost Ryan Shazier to that um, injury on Monday Night Football against the Bengals. Bad head injury, you know, some spinal issues, concerns. We don't know the full extent of that yet, other than he shut down for this season. Right. Um, hopefully he gets back on his feed and, and can play the game again you know as, as the biggest thing absolutely um but they're now really thin at, at a certain at a couple of spots at inside linebacker they've already um down a couple of players there they've had guys like arthur moats practicing at inside linebacker to try and cover that so they're effectively going to be He's running versatile. into this game yeah but they're effectively going to be running into this game with an outside linebacker playing inside linebacker you know that's how thin they're getting at that position that starts to add up after a while. You know, that becomes a problem that you can exploit over the middle. Um, Vince, Vince Williams, uh, who uh, essentially replaced uh, Shazier, he, he didn't completely replace him, but, you know, he's played a lot of snaps this year. Really weird season for an inside linebacker. He has been unbelievable as a, just, as a blitzer. Just get, getting in there, he had two sacks straight up against Kareem Hunt when they played Kansas City. He has seven sacks, five QB hits, and seven hurries on the season. So as a blitzing linebacker, Vince Williams is a – game changer for them just hasn't played well in coverage or against the run the things that your linebacker generally has to do down in down out so that is something to keep an eye on he's he's made those splash plays though vince williams can do no wrong um do you know why no why is he your guy because when we went to the training camp tour there was one player and one player only that i saw practicing in full pads and instead of having pants and leg pads on he had the full pads on top and shorts Full pads and shorts. That is how I used to practice because I hated leg pads. So Vince Williams is the only man that I saw in the training camp tour that understands the true way to play, which is pads and shorts. Because he dresses like you. Because he understands that leg pads are silly Just and shouldn't be worn when you can get away without not wearing Because he dresses like you. So Vince Williams so. is excellent. Well, he's been an animal rushing the passer. Uh, so that's Pittsburgh and their defense, Baltimore's defense, you know, this should be a fun matchup because Pittsburgh's offense has shown flashes of that explosive offense that we were expecting. And Buffalo, I mean, Baltimore's defense, even without Jimmy Smith, they have they've been shutting down teams. You know, yeah, but they now have the to cover Antonio Brown with that Jimmy Smith. Problem. Yeah, well, they should trade for William Jackson because he's the only guy in the league that can actually do it. <laughs> Who you got in this one, Sam? Pittsburgh. I am taking Pittsburgh as well. The lone PFF are taking. Baltimore is Gordon McGinnis. Who Sunday night football matchup. Also has the lowest uh, total of the PFF picks. Does he really? He's yes. like a three-time champion, too. Yeah. Rough year for the for the Scotsman. All right, last game. Monday night football. They just played a couple of weeks ago. New England Patriots going to be traveling to the Miami Dolphins. This time, Jay Cutler's playing. They faced Matt Moore a couple weeks ago. Cutler is back. Uh, your boy, Kenyon Drake. Was that our top-graded game? By a running back all season, I believe it was. Certainly was. 120 rushing yards, 106 of which came after contact and forced seven missed tackles. Two guys, Kenyon Drake and then Xavier Howard. Xavier Howard, the yeah. cornerback for the Dolphins. He was a guy you and I watched tape with. Uh, we watched tape on him side by side during the draft process. And remember saying a couple plays he looked like Richard Sherman and then another play he looked like a middle schooler trying to cover. Uh, last week, though, thrown it nine times. Only two receptions, 30 yards, two picks, and three pass breakups. That's five different plays touching the football. What are you seeing in this one, Sam? Yeah, Howard basically had one of those games where he put it all together. Um, I'm less – I'm less. I'm not sure he's going to continue that as much as I think Drake does have something about him um, and could potentially – this is a classic example of confirmation bias, and they both come in off fantastic games. I'm saying one guy isn't going to continue because I didn't like him when I evaluated right. him. The other guy is. Because I did. But we, we, we completely admitted if Xavier Howard has games where he looks like a Richard Sherman, you're like, yeah, he'll, that'll happen, but there'll be some really bad ones in there. And that's been kind of the story of his career, but a lot more bad than good so far. Yeah, but I think we've seen a lot of flashes from Kenyon Drake this season. There's definitely some talent there. Um, I just don't see this going dramatically different from the last time these two teams played. The Patriots are better. They're going to win. End of story. One thing to keep an eye on, uh, Rob Gronkowski suspended, first mm -hmm. of all. Uh, so New England does have to find. I think Chris Hogan's likely to come back for that receiving core. Uh, last time they played, it was one of those games where Brady attacks the middle of the field and Gronk's a big part of it. Uh, 
might have to change the game plan a little bit, throw to the outside a little bit more. And the Dolphins actually got a lot of pressure on Brady, maybe not from a pure percentage standpoint, but there were a lot of plays where they were on him quickly. And Dominican Sue pushing the pocket. Joe Tooney, the left guard, really struggles with power and uh, has struggled with Sue at times through the years. Sue versus Shaq Mason was a really fun matchup a couple weeks ago that as well, the fun. right guard. So th- those are the little trench trench matchups to watch, but I think we're all taking New England here at PFF. Yeah. Also, Stephon Gilmore has been on fire the past couple of weeks, looking like the guy they thought they were getting when they paid him big money. Um, and the other guy to watch out for is Deion Lewis has been absolutely phenomenal this season. For Quickness the and then power. He had a stiff arm and running. Dude, that guy can, yeah. he can run the ball. And New England has been trying to run the ball a little bit more these last few weeks. That season a couple of years ago where he was like breaking the elusive rating for a few weeks until he suffered that knee injury and we lost this statistically insane season. Yes. I mean, he's grading better now than he was that season and is doing it for obviously more snaps given that he's played the whole season. We're seeing him back to his best and his best appears to be pretty phenomenal. Yeah, he and Rex Burkhead really ran the ball well last week against the Bills. I know it's the Bills, but uh, something to keep an eye on as the Patriots uh, continue to have one of the most well-rounded offenses in the entire NFL. All right, guys, that'll do it for us today. That's all of your previews heading into week 14. Don't forget to get over to ProFootballFocus.com. Check out PFF Edge and Elite, where we're pulling out a lot of these stats. You can use PFF10 as a promo code to get you $10 off. And uh, what do we have coming up? We've got some awards, Sam. What do you want to ask the people here? Yeah, well, we're rolling into the award season. Um, And again, this year, PFF is going to be sending out physical awards actual trophies to players we're going to we had players them tweeting them out last year and yeah. instagramming them right so we're going to try and get them last year we just sent them a bunch of them to the team facilities and trusted them to get them in the hands of players we're not going to do that this year we're going to go right to the source we're going to try and get directly to all these guys we're going to send them their trophies um, and see if we can get them in their hands and if you would like to sponsor these awards we've got an opening hit us up at podcasts at uh, profootballfocus.com and you could potentially get your company name or logo on these trophies i like it if you guys are interested if you have uh any leads on that just just hit us up and we can uh we can make that happen so yeah podcast at profootballfocus.com all right guys thanks for listening everybody enjoy your week 14